Good evening, and welcome to an evening with Richard Dawkins in conversation with Julia Sweeney. I am Reba Boyd Wooden. I'm the executive director of Center for Inquiry, Indiana, the branch of the larger organization. We're located on the Canal Walk in downtown Indianapolis. We'd love for you to visit us sometime. If you'd like to have, know more about us, we have an information table back in the foyer where you can pick up information and a schedule of what we have going on here in Indianapolis. Richard Dawkins will autograph pictures and books after the event in the foyer if you want to go back for that. Uh, it might be a good time now to make sure you turn off your cell phones so that we don't have noise coming in in the middle of the program. Uh, Center for Inquiry Indiana is proud to be hosting such distinguished guests right here in Indianapolis. I want to thank all of our CFI Indiana volunteers who are helping out this evening. You can spot them with their name tags. Uh, feel free to ask them if you need assistance of any kind or have any questions. Also, I would like to thank my alma mater, University of Indianapolis, for allowing us to hold this event here on their campus tonight. I will now introduce Robin Blumner, who is the CEO of the Richard Dawkins Foundation, and since the merger of the two organizations earlier this year is also the C CEO of Center for Inquiry. I'll give it to Robin. Thank you. Good evening, Indiana. Thank you for being here tonight. Had everyone sleep last night? Yeah, quite a night. So, um, but we're in for an evening of evidence-based discussion, rational thinking, you know, kind of an oasis for, for people in this room who may not have had the best night last night. So enjoy it, because it's going to be short-lived. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Robin Blumner. I am the CEO of the Center for Inquiry and the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, and we're merging uh, because our missions are essentially equivalent. Uh, that's to promote reason, science, humanist and secular value, values, scientific uh, education in the schools, the teaching of evolution in the schools. Uh, so that's a really important reason to merge. We'll, we're, together, I think, we're, we'll be much more powerful, but we'll be much bigger, you know, and it's just easier that way to take over the world. So. Um, <laughs> I, I do, we're, we're nonpartisan, let's get that out, but I did want to uh, express some concerns about some of the things that the incumbent president has said during the campaign. Um, and I want to read from his convention acceptance speech. So Donald Trump didn't offer a lot of prescriptions for what he was planning to do once president, but this was one of them. He said, at this moment, I'd like to thank the evangelical and religious community in general who have been so good to me and so supportive. You have much to contribute to our politics, yet our laws prevent you from speaking your minds from your po own pulpits. An amendment pushed by Lyndon Johnson many years ago threatens religious institutions with a loss of their tax-exempt status if they openly advocate political views I am going to work very hard to repeal that language and protect free speech for all Americans. So on the agenda is the repeal of a Johnson, the Johnson Amendment, which uh, really restricted the ability of clergy members to electioneer from the pulpit, and it's something that, that we will be watching carefully and fighting against. Um, the other thing he's promised to do is to push for a $20 billion nationwide private school voucher plan. I think you have a voucher plan here in, in Indiana. And you know that a huge percentage of those dollars, government-funded dollars, end up underwriting religious and parochial school um, education. So it's a real inroad and erosion of church-state separation. Again, it's the kind of thing that CFI and RDF will be watching carefully and fighting against. Um, and finally, uh, we have to worry about the Supreme Court. Uh, we know that he's, that Trump has a list of very conservative right-wing 
potential nominees to the court, that he has one open seat and possibly more during his presidency that we suspect will further erode the separation of church and state. So the, the RDF and CFI will be on the case. We have a legal department. We have an office of public policy where we'll, we'll be lobbying for secular values and will be your voice in Congress. And rather than just be a little depressed over all of this, I really feel like this is our moment to galvanize to prepare for the next battle, and ultimately, um, history's on our side. I really do think that. Um, I keep hitting that. <laughs> so I also want you to think about being active yourselves. Uh, it's very important that you not only be active locally with uh, Reba's group, but that you, when you receive an action alert, you actually respond and get in touch with your elected representatives. You know, we have no representation in Congress, zero open atheists in Congress. And the reason for that is not enough open atheists urge their members of Congress to act on their behalf and not enough open atheists run for political office. So please, please get more active. Um, I think, as I said, the wind is at our back and we will, we, the future is ours. We just have to survive the present. So now I'd like to bring out comedian, writer, actor, Julia Sweeney, and the brilliant scientist, Richard Dawkins. such a nice welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to start off, Richard. I feel like we need a group therapy session right now. <laughs> and I, I mean, Robin sort of said, I haven't slept really well for weeks, actually. Um, I've been up in the middle of the night Googling um, Trump news and on 538. And then last night, I feel like I've gone through some terrible car wreck where I keep forgetting about it, and then five minutes later, I remember it happened, and then I, it's like it's sinking into my subconscious little by little. But anyway, um, so we're, we're a little on edge up here, aren't we, Richard? A little sleep deprived and a little freaked out. Um, and I'm sure all of you feel the same. But I wanted to reiterate, as Robin said, I, I'm trying to look for a silver lining, and I'm trying to be optimistic about. Good luck with that. <laughs> I know. Um, okay, so for me, it was during the Bush years that I, first I realized that I was a skeptic and that I didn't believe in God anymore and I was looking for people who felt the same way as me. And it was during that eight years that I found all these groups and it really became a national phenomenon during that time. And I just think, even though um, this new president-elect, Trump, is not the same as Bush in terms of being an evangelical, I think it's now is the time. Like, we're going to have a lot, so much to do. And there's going to be a lot of anger and questioning and ways to organize. And um, so I'm just trying to look at it as a really good time to get out and start having more conversations like this and bringing it more into the public space even than ever before. So <laughs> I'm just going to try to keep telling myself that all night. <laughs> um, so Richard, give us your general thoughts on what happened last night. <laughs> I believe that in courts of law, after the jury has delivered its verdict, occasionally the judge is able to overrule it on grounds that it's an obviously perverse verdict. <laughs> I'm kind of wishing that were possible uh, in, in, in this case. Um, it's a calamity even bigger than Brexit in Britain, and they do have some things in common. Um, I'm sort of looking around the world for where to go. Uh, <laughs> New Zealand seems to beckon, uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe Ireland. Uh, Julia, Ireland, you, yes. You, you have I have Irish relatives, yes, so. Yes. 
So maybe we'll, we'll, we'll go there. I know, I feel like it's the shock of it. I feel like I've watched a movie and I, the ending was so shocking that I just, it has to go back and be re-edited to have a different ending. Michael Moore, uh, who um, distinguished himself by forecasting this result quite some time ago, and I recommend the article that he wrote. It's called Five Reasons Donald Trump Will Win. And he hits five nails on the head just like that. And today he's written an article saying, don't go around saying you're shocked. Do something about it, more or less. Oh, he is. Oh, yes. I didn't see that yeah. one. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a very hard-hitting article. Um, and I recommend that, too. I keep thinking that, you know, like I feel like, you know when you're growing up and you meet people, your confirmed bachelor uncles, and you just think, oh, they just don't want to get married, and then you get older and you go, oh, they're gay. Like, you didn't realize that, and it's like you have that realization. I feel like I've gone through the same thing with people, especially young people, sadly, who I've met, who told me they were undecided about this election, and now I realize, oh, they were voting for Trump. Like, I didn't realize that. <laughs> like, all of them. I, I know it. I actually know it's true. And I'm so embarrassed that I was so naive about it. I was like, oh, well, let me tell you what I think. But really, they had already decided. There's got to be some reason why the polls got it so wrong. And, and that's the plausible reason as any, that people are simply ashamed to admit that they were going to vote for Trump. Yeah, I think that's true. I think they know that it's not socially acceptable, but they're going to do it anyway. Anyway, so um, here we are together, fighting the good fight. All right, um, so now, Richard, let's start, with, let's start with the recent innovations and the recent discoveries in biology. What do you think is the most important area in biology currently? Since 1953, uh, biology has become a branch of information technology, a branch of computer science, because with the discovery of this structure of DNA and the fact that it is a digital code, it's a digital code pretty much exactly like um, uh, the binary code of, of computers. Um, I, I've quoted in one of my books, I think I've got it here, a, a passage from a 1931 history of biology by Charles Singer which gets it so spectacularly wrong that I think it's <laughs> worth... And this is 1931. Yeah. <clears throat> so this, the, the, this was the view before Watson and Crick, before um, the, the discovery of the digital nature of DNA. Despite interpretations to the contrary, the theory of the gene is not... I'm sorry, I'm croaking. <clears throat> uh, perhaps I should give my little apology. Please forgive me if I croak. <laughs> you know, do you know what croak means in the United States? <laughs> Please forgive me if I croak. It's because I've had a stroke. <laughs> Basal ganglion on the right makes me walk as if I'm tight. So if I sink to groans and squawking, Julia must do the talking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good! I had not heard that! I, I will try to go on reading this. The gene is no more comprehensible as a chemical or physical entity, that is the cell or for that matter the organism itself. Further, though the theory speaks in terms of genes as the atomic theory speaks in terms of atoms, it must be remembered that there is a fundamental distinction between the two theories. Atoms exist independently and their properties as such can be examined. They can even be isolated. Though we cannot see them, we can deal with them under various conditions and in various combinations. We can deal with them individually. Not so the gene. It exists, only as a <coughs> it exists only as a part of the chromosome, and the chromosome only as part of a cell. If I ask for a living chromosome, that is, for the only effective kind of chromosome, no one can give it to me except in its living surroundings, any more than he can give me a living arm or leg. The doctrine of the relativity of functions is as true for the gene as it is for any of the organs of the body. They exist and function only in relation to other organs. Thus, the last of the biological theories leaves us where the first started, in the presence of a power called life, or psyche, which is not only of its own kind, but unique in each and all of its exhibitions. Now, that is spectacularly wrong. 
every detail of that is wrong, and it's typical of the kinds of things that were said before Watson and Crick came along. Nowadays, a gene can indeed be isolated. It can be purified, bottled, recrystallized. You can put it, you can print it out on paper. You can put the paper in a book and put it on a shelf, and then take the book down again a hundred years later and type the, 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 the DNA sequence back into a machine and make the DNA and make a living organism which follows the DNA. Everything about it is material. Everything about it is digital. It's just bytes and bytes and bytes of digital information. All that philosophical nonsense about psyche and, and life. life and things like that, it's all completely out of the window. And, and ever since 1953, that's been increasing. And now in the 21st century, uh, it's become actually cheap and easy to sequence a genome to the extent that we now have the complete genomes, not only of many individual humans, but also of uh, chimpanzees, of dogs, of, of wheat, of, of, of Drosophila. Lots and lots and lots of animals and plants have now been completely sequenced. Um, I, my own genome actually has been completely sequenced. I'm not talking about the 23 and me, or whatever it's called. I'm talking <laughs> about the complete genome, which was sequenced for a television program for Channel 4. Um, the original purpose of the television program was superseded and was turned into something else. It was quite, quite interesting, actually. It was that um, my genome was going to be put on a disc. Indeed, it is on a disc. I've got the disc. And it was going to be buried in the family vault in Chipping Norton Church. And then the idea was we imagine it being dug up in 500 years' time, and the genome read, which it could be, and me cloned, which I certainly would be, it would be possible in 500 years' time, actually probably in about 10 years' time. Um, and then uh, that gives rise to the whole television conceit of, of, of that you couldn't imagine how the television program would work. We'd, we'd have uh, <laughs> discussions about would, the, would, would, would my clone be me? Well, no, it would be an, my identical twin. Um, would it be a proper individual, or would it be a zombie? Well, talk to an identical twin about that. Um, <laughs> by the way, that's a wonderful way to tease Catholics when they, when they try to say that, that the soul enters the body at conception. Find a pair of identical twins. Actually, I met a pair this evening. Very charming they were, too. Um, <laughs> and ask them, which one of you has the soul? <laughs> <laughs> There they are, down there. <laughs> Which one of you is the zombie? Anyway, um, uh, and I was, and we, were, we, we were going to discuss the morality of cloning. Um, we were going to, I was going to write advice for my young clone 500 years hence. I know what your genes are like. Don't make, them, make the mistakes that I made. <laughs> anyway, that, that, that was what it was for. That's why my, my uh, genome got, got, got done, got sequenced. But it's now been used for a, a really very, very interesting purpose by Yan Wong, who is my co-author of the second edition of The Ancestor's Tale, my, my, my largest book. And what Yan did is really very, very nice. He took my genome and he looked, well, he told the computer how to look, at all my pairs of genes. You know that each chromosome you have comes from either your father or your mother. And so you can look down the chromosomes, and you can look at this gene from the father, that gene from the mother, this gene from the father, this gene from the mother, and so on. And ask the question, how far back do you have to go in history until you hit the common ancestor of this gene and its mate on, on, the, other, on the other chromosome? And we're talking tens of thousands of years or hundreds of thousands of years here. And he did it for a, a, a large sample of my pairs of genes and then plotted it as a graph. And the coalescence peaked. There was a, a very, very sharp, large peak at 60,000 years ago. And what that means is that 60,000 years ago, the population went through a bottleneck. There were very few people around. So we are descended from that very small population of people in that bottleneck. There weren't that many people from whom to get those genes, so they had to coalesce at that point. There are um, fewer of them coalesce at 
100,000 years, 200,000 years, 300,000 years, and so on. But there's this pronounced peak of 60,000 years. It's a remarkable fact that from the genome of one single individual, you can deduce exact facts about the demography of our ancestral population. He compared it with a Nigerian whose genome had also been sequenced and got only a very slight peak of 60,000 years, suggesting that the population from which the Nigerian came went through a, a much less severe bottleneck. Well, I think that's utterly remarkable that you can do that from a single individual, and it's rather a nice fact that one co-author of the book was able to do it on the genome of the other co-author <laughs> of, of the book. There can't be many instances of, the, of that. Also in the Ancestors' Tale, second edition, Jan collaborated with James Rosendell uh, to make pedigree diagrams of um, the entire animal and indeed plant kingdoms. Um, each chapter in this book has a different pedigree diagram. Now, the number of species of animal in the world is unknown, but it's probably up in the millions. It's, well, certainly in the millions. It may be 10 million, it might even be 30 million. And if you count the extinct species, it's billions. If you were to try to draw the complete family tree of all those species, draw it out. I mean, think of, think of how big a tree it would be. You probably can't quite imagine it. James Rosendell calculated that the bit of paper you would need to draw on, to draw this family tree, would stretch out to the orbit of Jupiter. It's a gigantic tree. You obviously can't draw that. So what did he do? What did he and Yang Wang do? They did it as a fractal. So you, it's on the computer screen, and you're looking at only one part of it at a time, and you can navigate about it, you can fly over it, rather like a sort of taxonomic Google Earth, and drill down to any particular part of it that you're interested in. You could drill down to Homo sapiens, or to a whale, or, or to, a, to a dragonfly, whatever you like. You can drill down to this detail, or you can zoom out again. The program is called One Zoom. You can zoom out or zoom in. And you're, at any one time, you're looking at some small part of, or indeed a, a larger part of, this family tree, which if you drew it out completely, would be parsecs wide. So that, that's two little vignettes of, of what, what I think is uh, to, il to illustrate how exciting uh, modern molecular genetics is, and, and the fact that the it has become... Can you go to look at it? Is it on a website? Yes, like one, zoom. one Zoom. Um, or okay. it, or um, ancestorstale.com. Ancestorstale.com, and then wow. you can go there. Oh, and by the way, um, not, not all the species obviously have yet been written in, and that would take forever. But what you can do is sponsor a species. So they're <laughs> crowdsourcing. You sponsor a species, and then that, that gets it written into the family tree, into, into the pedigree with your name. I've sponsored um, Vero Sifaka, which is a lemur in Madagascar, which is a very beautiful animal because it walks on its, on its hind legs, or rather it dances on its hind legs. Um, it, it lives in trees, but in order to get for, across forest clearings from one tree, tree to another, it stands on its hind legs with its arms in the air and dances across in a beautiful, bounding, balletic gait. <laughs> so if you want to sponsor some really nice animal, um, you don't look up the, either OneZoom or ancestorstale.com. That's so amazing. I mean, just think about, so everybody, every person in this room who has their DNA, the same thing could be done with them. Like yes. the whole idea that we, each one of us is just walking around with so much history and information in us. The history exactly. of everything. Yes, yes, it's you're really one of us, Julia. <laughs> what? Yes, I said you're one of us. <laughs> yes. yes. No, no, but it's it, so it, incredible. It, it, it is absolutely <gasps> incredible. And, and think what utter nonsense that, this thing I read, read you er, earlier. We are each carrying around within us a database, a digital database, which is inherited for hundreds of millions of years. You can think of it. I've actually called it the genetic book of the dead. It's a, it's a, you can read out from it um, not only what your ancestors were like, but 
but where they lived, I mean, in principle, you could read out, I, you can't do this yet, but my speculation is that it, hidden in that database is information about our tree-dwelling past, and before that, our, um, our well, our, ultimately, our, our sea-going past, when, when we were fish. It's all there. Isn't that amazing? It's all there in every one of your trillions of cells. And to me, there's no religion that has come up with any mythology or even any poetic language that even comes close yeah. to the real truth of how beautiful and magnificent and complicated and bearing of all life within every individual we are. I mean, yes. it n n doesn't get, come close. Not so, nowhere near. No. So why is it? I mean, like, why do you think Americans resist the idea of evolution so much. Why is it so threatening? I mean, it's so beautiful. I think it's, well, obviously it's because of religion, but, but, but then you have to ask why. Um, and I think that's because of childhood indoctrination, I, I, I think, and, and, and the fact that they're, ne they're not actually, many of people are not actually exposed to the wonderful facts that we now know of science, in particular of evolutionary science. Um, I've told before the story of a young man who came to Oxford from America and he'd been to a, some kind of Bible college and had uh, never learned about evolution. He learned a lot of biology, knew a lot of biology, but just not about evolution. And wow. um, he came to my lectures at, at Oxford and at the end of my course of lectures, he came down to the front and thumped the table with his fist and said, gee, this evolution, it really makes sense. <laughs> well, you know what? I feel like I can understand that because I think if you're raised <coughs> in, to try to, you're raised with these stories that are myths, but you're told that you're supposed to believe them as true, you're constantly having an agitation in your mind because they don't really make sense, but they're supposed to make sense. And for me, I thought there was something wrong with me for not, you know, that they didn't make sense. And one of the beauties of discovering, of, of evolution, I totally get it. Like, there's a great feeling about something when it makes sense. I mean, and it's sad that people who are indoctrinated with religion learn to filter that out and learn to be okay with the fact that what they're being taught doesn't make sense. But then the pleasure of something that actually makes sense. Oh. It's, yes, especially when it doesn't only make sense, but is utterly beautiful. Right. Yeah. Uh, now, um, so Selfish Gene, your book, it's the 40th anniversary of your book. Yes, it's, it's quite a red letter year for me because it's the 40th anniversary of the Selfish Gene, the 30th anniversary of the Blind Watchmaker, the 20th anniversary of Climbing Mount Improbable, the 10th anniversary of The God Delusion. So um, my publishers, especially in Britain, they all got together, it's quite unusual, they're four different publishers, they all got together and, uh, and agreed to have a sort of celebration, joint, joint publicity. So are they reissuing all those books? Yes, they are. Okay. Um, and the, by the way, I, I, I've forgotten about this, but the, the, the reissue of The Blind Watchmaker and Climbing Mount Improbable, both those books make heavy use of computer models that I wrote at the time um, for, of evolution called biomorphs and, and, and snailomorphs and things like that. Um, and they've cleverly printed the covers of this, of this book such that every single copy has a different biomorph on the, on the, on the, on the front. <laughs> so it's like those things called the Cabbage Patch dolls, which, which were, <laughs> well, there were, there were only a few hundred, hundred of those, but, but in, in this case, every one of these books has a, has a unique. So you have to try to get them all. <laughs> the, there's no such thing as all. I mean, the, <clears throat> there's an in, infinite number of them. And so e each book is individually printed and the computer randomly chooses a biomorph to print on the cover of each, each one. Oh, wow, that's incredible. I don't think that's ever been done before. I think, I think it's <laughs> now, when you wrote The Silver Gene, when did you, I don't know, maybe you've told the story before, but when did you come up with the idea of calling a meme a meme? Like when you decided on that name? Well, that was when I wrote The Selfish Gene in 1975. Um, but, um, but do you remember when you thought, well, I Jove, I've got it. Well, no, I. Um, <laughs> it's a meme. Um, 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 a meme is is the is the cultural equivalent of a, of a gene, and, and and the idea was was at the end of the selfish gene, which 
was all about the gene as the unit of selection. I wanted to make the point that it didn't have to be DNA. An anything self-replicating would do the job. I could, have, I could have used computer virus. I did use the uh, speculation about life on other planets, where there would have to be some equivalent of DNA. It wouldn't actually be DNA. <clears throat> um, then I thought, well, why not use something closer to home, the unit of cultural inheritance, something like uh, a clothes fashion, or a catchy tune, or a craze at a school, or a, a, or a, a baseball hat worn backwards, which, by the way, lowers the IQ by 10 points. Did you know that? <laughs> something about the pressure of that elastic band. That, <laughs> um, so that, that, that's what, that's what, what me memes were. I, I can't but remember. But why did you decide on memes? Well, I, I asked It could a, be theme. Yeah, I, 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 I asked a classical scholar <laughs> for some word that had a connection with copying. Oh, I see. And he said, my meme was the Greek word that would have that meaning. Oh, wow. And, and I wanted it to not exactly rhyme with Gene. I suppose it, it rhymes in a, in a rap sense. Yes. Um, uh, I think it rhymes in all <coughs> senses. No, no. No? No, no all right. Okay. No, um, <laughs> M, M doesn't rhyme with N. Oh. Um, but, 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 the, but the idea of the selfish gene itself, um, I, I actually was, was rather pleased to discover that I had some lecture notes. Um, dating from, I found in, in, the, in the cellar of my house lecture notes dating from lectures that I gave in Oxford in 1966, which is 10 years earlier than The Selfish Gene. Oh, wow. And, and the, the rhetoric that I used in those lecture notes is almost identical to The Selfish Gene. I've completely forgotten about it, but... but oh, um, really? So, yeah. And then it came back later. Yeah, so it, 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 it dates back 10 years before The Selfish Gene, actually. And then when you, so when the book came out, was that your first book, or did you yes, have a book yeah. before that? Okay, so when did you realize it was going to be a hit? I mean, like, was it immediately? I mean, because to me, that's how I knew about you. That was whatever, you know, that's the book. Yes, um, I'm, not sure I, I'm not sure I quite realized that. I'm not sure I still realize it. <laughs> um, <Aww>. um, <laughs> um, it. It did get a lot of very nice reviews. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, which, which in, in the... And it introduced a huge concept into the culture of, of the human culture. I mean, even my daughter, who's 17, when I said that you were going to come to our house, she said, Richard Dawkins, the meme. Like, she knows that. Like, high school students, they know that. Well, I, I'm sorry she didn't know about the selfish gene. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, why don't we just discuss for a moment the Ark Encounter in Kentucky and the danger of bringing school children there on class trips. Is there something wrong with that? I, I've never been, I, I, I haven't been there, but I understand that uh, Ken Ham built an ark. <laughs> yes. Um, but possibly even with the right number of cubits. Um, <laughs> And uh, what I find rather more disturbing is he did it with taxpayers' money um, and um, uh, earns money from people coming, and is, the whole thing is done with tax breaks, and uh, makes out not that this is a, a colorful illustration of one particular origin myth, which would be fine, but makes out that it's actually historically true. And for that to be done um, with taxpayers' money is obviously wrong. And it's obviously wrong that this should be presented as science, and school bu parties of school children bust to see it. So clearly, I, I take a dim view of it. Um, and similar things. I think Ken Ham also has a museum of creation yeah. somewhere else. To me, that's worse. Yeah. The Ark, I mean, I guess I feel like, you know, we're human beings. We tell stories. I mean, to me, as a, I like to think of myself as an artist, and stories are really important <coughs> to me, and I think all of us having stories that we all know, like the fact that we all know certain Bible stories is really artistically meaningful. You can constantly draw on it. You can bring up the idea of Noah's Ark and people understand it right away if you're using that in something. And I think it is important for a culture to have a certain number of stories that everybody knows those stories. And I'm perfectly willing for Noah's Ark to be one of those stories. So am I. Um, it's a beautiful idea, and it's a beautiful mythical story. 
but I don't understand why, why do people wreck it by insisting that it's true? Yes. Like to me, <laughs> like <coughs> you actually, <clears throat> you're taking away the best part of it by insisting that it's true. And then you're making the least interesting part of it the point. I mean, and so you're not even stopping to say, what a great story of this flood yeah. and this it's, guy. It's, it's not that great when you think that the whole purpose of the Enterprise <laughs> was to drown the entire human species and all the animals as well, except for those who, who found their way to the ark. I mean, it's actually a very, very... Okay, but what if you read... Like, you could tweak that a little bit. I mean, you could say, a horrible flood came. One guy had a boat. He was so upset the waters were coming and coming. He had to go gather up animals and some of his, his friends Julia, and family. It, and God did it deliberately. It didn't just happen. Well, I mean... God looked, looked, at, looked at his creation and decided saying, it like, was not it's good. It's one man's response to a, you know, a weather catastrophe. <laughs> and, and he did what he could. You know, he gathered I think you're some letting animals. God off too lightly there. <laughs> He became an alcoholic later, I'll yeah. note. <laughs> that the Bible even talks about. No, no one talks no. about it Noah is. laying around naked and drunk after the flood. It is a, it is a, no, that, that was Lot. Um, it is, you know about that? Yes, I do know, but I thought Noah also got, no, well, I, I think, I think it was Lot. But okay. may, maybe you're right about Noah too. I, I anyway, think, I think you're, it you're right. quite right that it, that it, that it is, it's, 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 it's part of the mythology of a culture, the Jewish culture, and it was derived from the Babylonian culture, um, where the story is exactly told, but with a, with a different named individual. Um, and that's fine, and it should be taught along with lots of other myths, like, well, in America, the myths of the various Native Americans would be, would be very good. They're, they also are very beautiful, and they're culturally important. Um, so yes, let, by all means, let it be taught as part of mythology, but not as science, scientific or historic fact. Yeah, I agree. I, I even think the story of Jesus dying on the cross um, is such a beautiful story for human beings a, about a person who, I mean, when they say Jesus died for you, <coughs> if you could reinterpret that as our ancestors sacrificed and were maybe even political dissidents, as in the case of Jesus, <laughs> and were killed for it, for you, not to make you feel guilty or he's watching over you, but because they helped to create civilization. They kept, helped to, they sacrificed to move civilization forward that we are all enjoying. That idea is so profound and it just completely gets lost in the idea of Jesus being actually the son of God. Anyway. Well, I think, uh, I, can I, I've done dissent a bit from that. Um, in, in many ways, it's a, it's a rather horrible myth because it... Um, no, I think no, it's both. Believe no, me, I get that it's good, you know. I, I mean, let, I, I, let me just expand on that, on that a bit. Um, God wanted to forgive sins, all the sins of humanity, and particularly he wanted to forgive the original sin of Adam, who never existed. Um, so rather than just forgive all of our sins, he thought it necessary that blood must be spilled. You cannot forgive, St. Paul actually said, there can be no forgiveness without bloodshed, or words to that effect. Um, so it's a, I think it's actually rather a disgusting idea that, there was, that the only way he could forgive our sins was to have a scapegoat, his own son, like he, he himself in, in some interpretations, tortured and killed Otherwise, he, he wasn't, uh, wasn't capable of forgiving our sins. This creator of the universe, this, this genius of physics and quantum theory and relativity who was capable of creating the universe, uh, was not capable of thinking of a better way of forgiving our sins. <laughs> but Richard, this is it. You keep bringing God into it. If you really take God completely out of it, if you just say, here's a story of a guy who had some different political ideas oh. that went against the time, no and doubt. he was imprisoned yeah. and killed for it, yeah. and you know maybe something good came out of it. Yeah. That's a oh. good story. Uh, that is certainly a good story. <laughs> and, um, I mean, not a, a laugh riot as story. A, as a political revolutionary. <laughs> yes. Yeah, quite, yes, but, but that, that's not the Christian interpretation. <laughs> no, but I mean, I guess that's a point. Like, after being an atheist now for 15 years, I guess, um, it's been, 
I, and I occasionally go, because I'm, I'm sort of a, I sort of am interested in churches, and I often go on Sundays to different churches and hear the stories, and I am struck by how beautiful the stories are, but it takes a lot of reinterpretation. <laughs> I have to filter it through a lot of Well, so the, so the Greek myths and the, and, the, yeah. and the Valhalla myths and so on, yes. Yeah. Okay, so what are you working on now? Well, um, partly I'm working on a, an anthology of my previous writings. Um, I did that once before in a book called A Devil's Chaplain, and I'm now doing it for later writings in a book called Science in the Soul. And um, so that's one thing I'm doing. The other thing I'm doing is concentrating on uh, my foundation and the CFI, which it's, which it's merged with and which is our host tonight. Um, and so that occupies a lot of my time. Uh, I founded the Richard Dawkins Foundation in both Britain and America, and the, the British Foundation doesn't do very much now except give out money. Um, the American Foundation. And why do you think? You mean they don't have events like we don't? We somewhere? don't have somebody. We, we don't have a Robin um, who, 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 who runs things. But oh. the, the, the American Foundation has Robin Blumner um, and, and several other people, and is now merging with the Center for Inquiry, which has a very large number of employees, and is doing a lot. And I'm very enthusiastic about the things that it's doing. Um, things like the Openly Secular campaign. I think you saw a, a display up on the screen before we came in. The Openly Secular campaign, um, the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science teaching middle school teachers how to teach evolution and how to resist the pushback that they get from parents and pupils and school boards and people like that. So I'm very enthusiastic about what's going on in America in these two foundations. and spend quite a lot of time um, coming over here. OK, I have, another, I have one more question, and then we'll go to questions from the audience. Um, are there any biological extinctions that you would view as virtuous? For instance, should we eradicate the mosquito? Mosquitoes uh, carry malaria. They hardly suffer from malaria themselves, by the way. Um, the, the malarial parasite leaves them pretty unscathed, um, but it scathes us very severely. Um, and a, is, that's an interesting point, by the way. Um, the malarial parasite, which is a protozoan, gets spread by the mosquito um, from patient, from human to human, or from animal to animal. Uh, and it's part of the strategy of the parasite to use the mosquito's wings as its vector and so it doesn't want to make the mosquito sick, because then the mosquito oh. wouldn't be capable of flying and taking blood meals and going from one, one so person evil. to another. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the mosquito is, is, doesn't feel any, any ill effects. Um, but the human feels very severe ill effects, lies in a, in a fever, um, and st lies still. So it can be the passive victim of mosquitoes. Um, that's an aside, but it's a very interesting aside. Um, would I wish to extinguish the Anopheles mosquito? It's a tough one, that. I mean, I, I, I Do suppose... Do we know if it does anything beneficial? Sorry? <laughs> Do we know if the mosquito does something like that if we eradicated it, it would, we would suffer some consequences? Well, th that? That, that's a possibility, but, I, I, but I, I, I don't know of any reason why we should th think that. The, um, other, other species of mosquito could um, carry other diseases, like yellow fever, for example. Um, and dengue. Um, uh, I, I'm reluctant to. I mean, I'm reluctant to say we should we should drive a, a, such a beautiful, elegant survival machine as a mosquito extinct. Although um, we're putting so many other species extinct, <laughs> it seems a, like that's just one that's really yeah. bothersome in that a, we could just a, focus a, on. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, I think I'd, I'd give it l less priority than the African elephant or rhinoceros or, or <laughs> yes. tiger. All right, great. Well, I think we're going to take questions from the audience. And um, is there a microphone over here? Is that how we're doing it? And is there one upstairs, too, or just down here? OK. OK, go ahead. Professor Dawkins, you very frequently use the words Darwinian and evolutionist to describe you and your colleagues. Do you believe that that word uh, or phrase has been hijacked or created by the creationist movement in order to attempt to invalidate 
the theory of evolution by making it appear more religious. I didn't quite hear the cru crucial part. Do you, the, 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 the phrase Darwinian evolution. Darwinian, ev uh, no, yeah. uh, evolutionist and Darwinian to describe uh, or people who accept the theory. Yes. You, do, do you mean that actually using the word Darwinist might be used to discredit it? Yes. Because, so. because yeah. of, uh, because of it, it, it makes it sound like a sort of school of thought, like, like Marxist or Freudian. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, so some people have problems with it. I, I don't really. I, I, I think it's um, not particularly harmful. Um, and I, I'm happy to call myself a Darwinist myself. Um, but I could be persuaded that it's a bad idea. I mean, I, I am open to suggestions like that because God knows we need, <laughs> we, 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 need we, we get misunderstood so often that it's well worth thinking about that. Thank you for that. I always think on that note that I don't like when, say, when people say, do you believe in evolution? Yes. I always say, I always rephrase it. I accept the theory of evolution as a scientific, you know, fact. Like, I don't, like, I feel like when they use the word believe, they're already trying to pigeonhole you. Like, you have your beliefs, I have my beliefs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I just hate that. Do you believe? Ugh. Okay, thank you. Hey, Professor Dawkins, just curious if you have any thoughts on the CRISPR-Cas9 and any concerns with it. On, on what? On the, what? Uh, the CRISPR-Cas9, the new technology to... Oh, CRISPR. Yes. Um, I don't know much about it. I mean, it's clearly the latest thing in the sort of molecular technology that I was talking about, uh, uh, about earlier. And so, yes, I mean, it's obviously an, an exciting innovation. Next. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. How do you think genetic engineering will influence the future of the selfish gene? Well, um, genetic engineering is uh, something we can do using the technology of, of, of um, genomics to actually alter genes, change, change genes, engineer mutations. It's long been known that you can increase the rate of mutations by things like um, radiation and uh, chemical agents, chemical mutagens. Um, but genetic engineering would be actually trying to steer evolution by implanting uh, mutated genes in, into individuals. This has been done with uh, biology, with agricultural crops, uh, engineering um, antifreeze genes from Arctic or Antarctic creatures into crops to stop them being damaged by frost rick, for instance. So it can be done. Um, I presume the interest of your question is what about what if we did it to humans? Uh, and it's theoretically possible to do that. Um, it, it, it would give rise to all sorts of political, social, ethical qu questions if you were to um, engineer desirable characteristics into, uh, into a human baby. Um, and philosophers, moral philosophers, uh, discuss that, that sort of question. Um, I, think it's worth discussing. It's, it's, it's a thing that we've, that's become a bit of a taboo because of um, Hitler's rather fumbling attempts to do eugenic breeding um, in, in the, the 1930s and 40s. Um, and I, I, I hesitate before recommending it, but it's possibly something that, 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 we, might, that we might consider, and it's something that might, uh, in, in the future, we, we might look look back on this as, as a kind of watershed event in our history when this, when this started to happen. Um, I think it's notable that during all these centuries in which we have been capable of selective breeding of humans, we've been selectively breeding cows and pigs and horses and cabbages and carrots and corn and wheat. Um, and we've never done it to humans except, as I say, Hitler's brief attempt. Um, so those who are worried by the ethical implications might be comforted by the fact that although we could have done it to humans at any time during past thousands of years, we, we actually haven't. So maybe there's not the, it's not obvious why we should suddenly want to start doing it with the mutation half of evolution, not just the selection half. You know, in a way we're doing it in 
like when women get pregnant and they get ultrasounds and they can decide to terminate a pregnancy yeah. if a baby has certain conditions, yes. that in a way, you know, like is a way of doing it too. Yes. Like it really is happening that way. That's, that's less controversial when it's a, m a matter of removing, right. um, d removing damaged uh, right. f f fetuses. Um, or you could do it earlier than that, not r earlier than the ultrasound stage. You can actually, um, using IVF in vitro fertilization, right. um, when you've got, um, say, 10 uh, eight cell embryos from the same couple in a Petri dish, and uh, you can, without damaging the embryo, you can remove one of the eight cells and look at its DNA. And so if you know that this couple is at risk of producing a child with, say, Huntington's chorea, which is a horrible, horrible disease, dominant gene, um, then uh, instead of putting back one or two of these embryos into the woman at random, which is what's done at present, right. you, could, you could choose ones that don't have the Huntington's chorea. Right. I find it hard to imagine that anybody could, could right. find Who ethical object objections to that. To that. Yeah. What they might have objections to, and again, I'm not totally, see, I don't easily see why, is it if, you, if you knew, this can't be done yet, but in future, if you knew that, um, that some of these em embryos had a gene that, made, that was going to make the child good at music, say, and you wanted to have a musical child, rather than put back one of the embryos at random, put back one of the, one of the dozen embryos that has the, the, good, the good music gene. Um, a lot of people would find that repugnant, but those same people would not find repugnant the idea that you un either force or persuade your child to take music lessons and <laughs> <laughs> practice the piano every day. Um, so I think we get a little bit confused in our, mor our moral reasoning sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. Let's go upstairs for yes, one and then upstairs. go back and forth. I forgot. About this you. is a uh, more of a cultural question. Uh, it seems that, uh, at least in America, you rose to prominence along with the uh, other horsemen. Almost, it seemed like, in response to the attacks of 9-11. And then over the past five years, there have been somewhat of a backlash against, uh, uh, against that uh, uh, cultural phenomenon. Uh, and so I just wanted to see what you, uh, what your ruminations were about how we got to where we are and, and, and how we move forward from here culturally. Do you mean a, a backlash to the, to the backlash? The yeah, uh, yeah, a, a kind of a response, even among uh, people who uh, purport, uh, purported atheists, um, to uh, the concept of um, cultural or, or conversational intolerance of uh, uh, religious positions that uh, uh, Sam Harris has talked about and that, and that you've certainly uh, 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 exhibited uh, in your uh, debates. Yes, I, mean, I think it's very important to make a distinction between um, attacking a religion, which I'm very happy to do, and, <laughs> and attacking the in individuals who are um, pro pro proponents of, a, more often victims of that religion. So when Sam Harris and I attack Islam, we always make it very, very clear we are not attacking individual Muslims, far from it. We regard individual Muslims as the main victims of the oppressive uh, doctrine of Islam. So I think it is important to, to make that distinction, and, and partly because people don't get that distinction, that the backlash that you describe has arisen. Thank you. Uh, I've been wondering about uh, reverse evolution. I've seen over the recent years we've got the uh, hot coffee on the genitals, and uh, so we're basically rewarding people the more stupid they are. And, and then we've also got medicine, which is discouraging evolution. So people are surviving these days who should never have survived. Our genetic code's getting worse and worse, and we're rewarding bad behavior. And so it's extreme, and have you seen this? That's a question. And also, so I was very, very happy when I saw last week that the first ever baby was born with the gen genetic code of three people. The woman had a, a defect, uh, some genetic faulty code, and they yeah. replaced it, they spliced in some good code so that the baby would be fine. And that was extremely exciting because it's not like a plaster where you, you're covering over something which is faulty, you're actually fixing the genetic code so that it will be fixed forever until it mutates again. Yes. So that's a tremendous breakthrough. Yes, I, I, I worry a little bit about um, uh, when, when, when we say things like pe people being born who shouldn't have been born. Um, I. I um, I mean, in, in, in one sense, you're, you're right, of course, that, that genes are getting into the gene pool that in a state of nature would not have done so because 
the people bearing those genes would have died before they reached reproductive age. I like living in a society where we have doctors and hospitals and where people are cured of diseases, and so I, I, I shrink from going so far as to say that the, the, these people should not be allowed to re reproduce or whatever. I mean, I think, I think, I, I think it's worth it, actually. I, mean, I think, I think as, as long as medical science can sort of keep up, I, I would prefer to, uh, to, 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 to not um, coerce people. Um, it, it, it's one thing to give advice to couples who have, um, one or both of them have genetic problems and say, you do realize, don't you, that if you have a child, it's likely to have this and this problem. And perhaps and what if something. it's two people that are just really irritating? <laughs> That's a tough one, Julia, yes. But I agree. I mean, the truth is, I mean, the more I learn about our hunter-gatherer past, the kind of brains and bodies that we had to have, you know, up till 10,000 years ago when agriculture came in, was probably a lot more rigorous and difficult, and I probably would have not made the cut. But it, there is something to be said for the fact that we are now able to, you know, sustain life and many lives that aren't necessary. You know, anyway, it's a hard topic. It's a hard topic, but I hear what you're saying. Well, we can actually fix it now, so we don't have to worry. I was worried there for a moment that we were going the wrong way, but now we're able to fix the code if we want to. Well, if, if you can fix it, so much the better, yes. <laughs> Oh, let's go upstairs. Uh, hello. First off, I want to say thank you. It is an honor and a privilege to be here. So thanks for that. Oh, there you are. Um, in light of events that happened yesterday, I uh, got on Facebook this morning and I saw a disturbing meme, and it identified our incumbent president as an atheist in disguise. And this gave me a weird feeling in my stomach, and I had a bit of a drive to think about why. And it feel I, my question comes from, he did not label himself as an atheist, an educated person, a questioner. Um, this is never a word he used. And right away, before he even makes mistakes, he's getting lumped in a garbage pile. And he's getting lumped in this pile with Hitler and Mao and Stalin. And when people say, a war has never been fought in the name of atheism, they say, oh, but what about? But that's, abusing religion is not the same as fighting a war over it. And it's important to make that distinction. So on behalf of the community of free thinkers and humanists and atheists and such, what are some measures that we can take to not let a title that we identify with proudly right. and happily be distorted into someone else's garbage pile? Because it's not just atheist criminals that are filling up prisons. It's not us running amok. It's this term that's abused unfairly. And when I see memes like that, I really want to respond with, haha, I got to use your word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how do we prevent that from happening on a larger scale so that people who don't understand what this, we'll say, philosophy is, don't abuse it further? So you're, you're saying that, that they, were, they were using it as a term of abuse. They were, they were, they were saying right. Trump is an, is, a, is, a, is an atheist. How terrible. In disguise, um, but that's not who he pandered to, and that's not what he labeled himself yes. as. And he's not. He's just an opportunist. I think yes. he just goes with whatever yes. gets him as, to the next place he wants to go. And if that's well, whatever. Robin quoted those various speeches from his sucking up to um, evangelicals. By the way, Hitler was not an atheist. I uh, knew it. Uh, I, uh, Mao, Mao was. Um, there's he, lots of terrible atheists, but you know, there's lots of the, terrible. Yes, it, the, the, <laughs> the question is not can you, can you find terrible people who are atheists or indeed terrible people who are Christians or, or, or Muslims, say. The question is not that. The question is is there any logical pathway that, that leads from atheism to wicked behavior? And there isn't. Uh, there is a logical pathway that leads from certain kinds of religion to wickedness. And it, what it means is that, that because people have their faith, that they're doing the righteous thing for their God, they believe, they don't think they're wicked, they think they're doing the right thing. They think God wants them to fly a plane into the World Trade Center, whatever it is. They think they're doing good. 
So that's the logical path that leads from religious faith to hideous violence. I don't think you can say the same thing of atheism. I can't imagine a logical train of thought that would lead from atheism to... I think you could say this. I would correct them and say he's not really religious, but he's not an atheist. An atheist implies something else. And in my mind, a much better thing and a much more dignified thing. But I think that you could argue that he's not particularly religious or he's using religious trappings to further his own interests. Like, I think maybe correcting them that way. He thinks be, he's God. Yeah, and also because, <laughs> like people think, because there's a lot of people who aren't religious, but they're not atheists. They haven't really thought it through that far. They're not, they haven't committed that far. They're not that deep of thinkers to even get to that far. But they're not religious either. They're just, you know, and so to me, being just not religious is actually a much, much sharper barb at him than saying that he's an atheist, which of course I like that. But I guess I would try to correct them that way. I don't know. Hello. Um, my question is for uh, Dr. Dawkins. Um, first off, I wanted to thank you so much for um, opening up, um, you know, um, for me personally, ideas that I didn't know before I um, came across your work, so thank you so much. Um, but um, in terms of um, the elections that happened last night, I think Trump was pretty open to the fact that he's you know, denying any kind of climate change. So I was just wondering, um, do, you, are you, um, do you think that um, since Trump controls the presidency now and a large part of the government will be Republican, if there's any kind of like, uh, I guess, hindrance to scientific progress in the US, do you think other parts of the world um, can take up the, the challenge and um, help stop climate change or and, and the US is just gonna sit back and watch the rest of the world take over um, in, in terms of scientific progress? Well, I think he's, he's announced his intention of repudiating the Paris Agreements, um, which, is, which is terrible if, if true. On the other hand, he seems to have so little idea of what he wants to do that he may forget about that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not even him, though. It's the people who will be controlling him. It's his advisors. I mean. yeah. No, it's a, it's a very serious problem because the United States is, of course, a, a major um, industrial power with, with in, an enormous impact on world, world climate. And, things under Obama were starting to go really well. I mean, the real tragedy is we didn't get Al Gore in, in 2000. Um, up there. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I found that whenever I discuss either the election or Trump and reli uh, or religion with religious people, I found that reason is necessary, but always insufficient in changing people's minds. And so I was just wondering, uh, besides that evidence, argument, uh, what else can uh, we do to combat this irrationality? I think there's a, a tendency for people to think they're voting in their own interests, and actually they're voting exactly the opposite way. They're, they're voting against their own interests, and, yes. which is very sad. Um, I, I suppose I, I don't often quote Tony Blair, but, but education, 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 um, tr trying to do something about, about teaching logic, teaching how to use critical thinking, how statistical thinking, um, evidence-based thinking uh, from childhood on uh, is the, all, all I can think of. It, well, it ought to be obvious, is, but isn't People do make decisions based on their emotions. I mean, like, that isn't even how our brain architecture works. So I understand what you're saying. Like, when I, I used to try to convince people using rationality and facts, and now I feel like I do try to finesse it where I use those things, but I try to find, depending on what the argument is, um, where the emotions lie. Like, we are here to care for each other. 
we should all be caring about each other. I'll bring up, like if it's immigration, think about um, you know, when the Irish were coming over and they were welcomed on these shores and how they've done. Or like, I try to appeal to their emotions about it or try to get people to understand that we're a tribal people that evolved caring about each other and that's why we survived. And we just have to make that picture larger and including more people. And then I hope that through the emotion of it, they can see. And I've had more success with that, even though it's still hard. But some people just react against that. I mean, some people are, are, are have no interest in other people's um, troubles at all. I, mean, I know. I don't. I used to really see the good in people. I used to believe everyone was essentially good. And now I really, I hate this fact. I hate that this is true about me. I'm 57. And I really have changed over the last few years. I think people really are out to screw other people most of the time. And that's a horrible way to look at the world. I don't even like that. I, that's just so not my way to do it. But uh, it may Well, be half, true. half of people are out to screw the other people. The thing is to try to increase the number who, who take your view. And, and <laughs> I, I, I once wrote an article called Atheists for Jesus, uh, which <laughs> What was that about? Well, it was, it was a, it, I, I pointed out that, that, that there are quite a lot of people who actually are Jesus-like in that they are altruistic and caring, the good Samaritan, caring for other people, wanting to, wanting to do good, um, and the other half don't. And uh, using... The givers and the takers. Yes. G Jesus is a good role model for, uh, for a giver. Uh, and so I wanted um, atheists to try to um, adopt the role model of Jesus mm -hmm. um, as, as, and try to swell the number of, of what I call the super nice. Uh, <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> How's that working? Well, it, it, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. I know it. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So been trying to think about how to frame this question, but I think it really gets to, uh, has any of your work ever looked at a way to model uh, the limit of, of human population on our planet and, and what the consequences are for the human race if we don't find a way to put the brakes on uh, the level of human population on the planet? I have not done any modeling of population growth um, and I agree with you that it needs to be limited. Um, and um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> but it's also, it's also like you can look at it two ways. It's population or how much resources the individuals in the population consume. You could have more individuals if they were consuming less. Yes, anyway. but up to a point. Up to a point. <laughs> yes, up there. So if you look at a map of the election results, you'll see the urban areas tend towards more uh, liberalism, more social support systems, where the rural areas tend more towards conservative philosophies and more of a kind of a keep to yourself, self-reliance system. So I guess I was wondering what the evolutionary reasoning behind that would be. I'm not sure about that. I, I do know that there, that there is statistical evidence that um, countries and areas and states that have social welfare security, where people feel secure, feel taken care of, are least likely to be religious and vice versa. Um, so in Scandinavian countries, say. I guess really the question is more, it seems like the more people are living in close quarters, like in cities, they seem to be more towards the liberal side, where when they're more spread out, they always yeah. seem to go Republican. Yes, I, 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 I mean, I'm aware, aware of that trend, and you see it on the, on the map. By the way, the very, very nice map that I was sent today, which was what the map would look like if you just took the votes of people from 18 to 25, almost all blue. <laughs> I mean, I think that isn't really an evolutionary thing. I think that's just a cultural thing and an exposure thing. People who live in bigger cities have to be tolerant of many more different people. They're used to being around people. And I think that people live in rural areas, get to be alone with their thoughts, and think they're the only people that live around there. I mean, like, 
and that's a harsh generalization, but I feel like, my feeling is I love big cities. I mean, I think we should, I mean, I understand wanting to be in the countryside, I get it, but I feel like cities foster an understanding of humanity. You're constantly having to cooperate, you're constantly seeing other people, different people, and it creates a world view and an understanding of yourself as just one person in a big group of people that I think that you don't get in the rural, rural areas, especially when it's all one religion or one ideology or one race. It just doesn't expose those people's people to a big multitude of different people. And I think that's how that happens. I don't know. Um, yeah, what's an organism that has, uh, I guess, like an evolutionary trait that you find really complex and interesting and beautiful? And I guess on the flip side of that coin, what is an organism that you sort of look at sometimes and you go, how did this thing survive, you know, millions of years to You're still so be ugly. bumbling around? <laughs> well, yes, I mean, the, the, the last one, I mean, I suppose the, the official answer is every, every organism is beautifully designed for its way of life. But um, Douglas Adams, in his book, Last Chance to See, has a wonderful description of the New Zealand bird, the kakapo, um, which uh, he says something like, um, it has forgotten how to fly, but it's also forgotten that it's forgotten how to fly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so great. And, and so from time to time, it would <laughs> climb up into a tree and launch itself off and then f fall with a sickening thud on the ground. <laughs> um, I, I, I suppose that m maybe, I mean, the, ca the kakapo is certainly in danger of extinction. Um, and uh, obviously quite a lot of other animals are as well. W and you ask about the other extreme, an animal that's beautifully designed. Well, most animals are beautifully designed. Um, Just really complex in an interesting way, I don't know. Okay, well, um, let, but, I mean, you're design. asking me to tell a story, and I, I like Julia, I like telling stories. <laughs> um, so I'll tell a story of a maggot, which lives in Africa, and uh, it's a, the maggot is a larva of a fly, uh, and um, the maggot is, is um, designed to be fl to f um, swim around in, po in puddles or ponds. And then when the dry season comes, uh, the, pu the puddle dries up, and the maggots burrow down into the ground, uh, into, into, into the mud, where they rest until they're ready to pupate and emerge as adults. But, if you've ever watched drying mud, you'll know that, it, that cracks form, a sort of jigsaw pa pattern of cracks form. And these cracks are in danger of cutting right through where the maggot is burrowed, which would, which would, be, which would kill it. So the maggot takes steps to avoid a crack invading its space. And what it does is before it burrows down into the ground, it burrows round in a in a corkscrew motion, and then in a reverse corkscrew coming back. And then it finally goes down the middle where it, where it sits and waits to pupate. And what that does is it weakens a cylinder where it burrowed around in the corkscrew. There's a cylinder of, of weakened mud. Um, and so when the crack comes sneaking along the mud, when it hits the cylinder, it goes around the where the, where the maggot is. And so this maggot is behaving as if it has foresight. It's behaving as if it's prophesying what would happen in the future. Of course, it's doing nothing of the kind. Its nervous system is simply designed by Bye. natural selection working on the genes. <laughs> yep. um, another similar example um, is, another, is a caterpillar in this case which this is described by the German zoologist Wolfgang Wickler. Um, it, it pupates in a curled up leaf. And the way it does it is it bites its way through the stem of the leaf, the petiole. And that causes the leaf to curl up, the leaf dies and curls up and curls up around the caterpillar. Well, that's all right, except that it, that draws attention to itself because in a tree full of leaves, it's the only one that's curled up, and so the predator that's looking for caterpillars will go for it. So what the caterpillar does is it goes around beforehand 
and bites through the petiole of lots of other leaves all around. <laughs> and then finally, does its own. So it no longer it calls attention to itself. Once again, this oh looks God, like a beautiful piece of foresight, of prophecy on the part of the animal. Once again, it's simply wired into the nervous system by natural selection. Great are the wonders of natural selection. And just think how, <laughs> I know. <laughs> think how, think how long it took to learn that. That's what I think of how many died just biting one yeah. other leaf. Yeah, so that's, you've, you've got it, that's right. Yeah. Okay, where were we before? We were here, is it there? I think so. Okay, thank you. Up there. Um, how are the humans and societies of the farthest future you can ambition like? Uh, how, how are humans of the future? Yeah, the farthest you can envision. How are they, oh, how do they behave? You, are you asking about some sort of distant, I mean, millions of years hence? Yes. Yes. Um, well, I, I, I'm not going to predict that. Um, <laughs> do you think we'll be around in millions of years? Well, I think we might have a better chance of that than many. I mean, mo most species have gone extinct. I mean, mo most, right. most species have, that have ever lived have, have gone extinct. Um, sometimes the extinction is um, due to a catastrophe like a meteorite, the one that killed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Um, we, we might have a good chance of surviving that, not as a whole, but, but um, the, our species might survive that because, um, well, for one thing, we, we, could, we, can see, we might in the future see it coming, and uh, this is something that we need to work out the technology for. It's not that far off. I mean, the the feat of landing a spacecraft on a comet shows that we are capable of uh, reaching out to comets and meteorites. And so we could reach out not really just to a lander, which is what the Beagle thing, thing did, but um, explode a, a device which nudges it off course so that it doesn't hit the Earth. So, and the dinosaurs obviously couldn't do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we might be able to deflect the missile before it hits us. Um, but if we couldn't do that, then we might be able to survive by going underground um, for a couple of years while the nuclear winter lasts and taking seeds down and, and coming out and, and repopulating the Earth again. So there's a good chance we might not go extinct. Would we evolve to look like something completely different? Well, that's an interesting question. If you look back two million years, say, the thing you'll notice is that brains have got bigger. Our, our brains today are bigger than they were two or three million years ago. We can see that from fossils. So would you expect that tendency to increase? Well, only if the biggest brained individuals, let's, let's jump a bit and call them the brightest individuals, the most intelligent individuals, are the ones who have the most children. Oh, that's going to happen. <laughs> uh, so we probably can't expect to see an increase in, br in brain size. <laughs> um, um, I su suppose if we um, realize um, the dream of people like Elon Musk and go to Mars, if there's not much gene flow between the parent planet, Earth, and Mars, then you might expect that there would be perhaps ev evolution of uh, some kind of divergent type on, on Mars. The, gra the gravity on Mars is much weaker. The optimal body shape uh, would be a more spindly, lanky uh, one. If we, if we went to a planet with a, a, with a stronger gravitational field, we'd, we'd have massive great limbs We'd, we'd look so like if I wanted to be tall and thin, I should go to Mars. No, <laughs> um, it wouldn't. You, if you wanted your great 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 grandchildren to be okay, tall. Okay, well you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, over here. Uh, my question is on the evolution of consciousness, and I just uh, read a book called *The Ancient Origins of Consciousness*. And I appreciate what you have written in the past about how the the history of species from generation to generation, there's not a clear line of when a species becomes a species. Uh, and this book 
um, and, the, and that you, you, you spoke against the, the idea of essentialism in terms of a species. Um, this book talks about um, the anatomical um, hierarchies of, of brain, of the brain, and how evolution, how consciousness evolved. Do you think that there is or has been a very gradual uh, increase through evolution of consciousness? I'd be very surprised if consciousness suddenly switched itself on like a light uh, at some point in, in evolution. It seems to me much more likely that like everything else, it would have happened gradually. And so I, I would imagine that, um, that there are species where consciousness is a kind of dim uh, version of, what, of what, what we have, and that it was a gradual um, increase. Uh, I don't, it's, the, the, the nature of consciousness is, is philosophically very difficult, and uh, I think is so far unsolved. Um, so I, I can't answer the philosophical question, but as an evolutionist I can say, can answer your question and say, yes, I think um, that it would have been, it would have evolved gradually, and that probably means that there are many species around which are half conscious, three quarter conscious, one quarter conscious, um, as, as compared to, uh, to us. Up there. I'd like to thank you both for coming in tonight and sharing your viewpoints with us. Uh, Dr. Dawkins, I've uh, enjoyed reading your books and Lawrence Krauss's books. Uh, after having gone through those, I branched out into Peter Bogosian's book, uh, Creating Atheists, and it was about three quarters of the way through that. In my job, I travel a lot, and as usually happens, late at night, I end up at a bar in a hotel restaurant eating, um, and I'm at the mercy of whoever sits next to me. One night, this lady came in, and she started speaking to me very religiously, and I just kindly responded to her, but never responded back in kind religiously, and she finally came out and said, are you an atheist? And other than my wife and children, I'd never kind of come out of the atheist closet. Um, so I said, yeah, and she goes, well, let me tell you about Jesus and how he can save your life. And so, so we had an evangelical evangelist, Christian evangelist there trying to convert me, and I was a, you know, a virgin closet atheist evangelist <laughs> trying to convert her. Um, but by the end of the conversation, um, she had, had weakened, and I could see that she was visibly questioning you know, her own thoughts and her own beliefs. And, and, but instead of feeling excited, that, yeah, I got one, I felt kind of sad because she has so much engendered her religious beliefs into who she was and what she was that when you strip that away, she just seemed to be lost. And I kind of walked away feeling guilty. How do you resolve that? Well, uh, Daniel Dennett said, there's no easy way to tell somebody that they've wasted their entire life. <laughs> <laughs> However, I, th I think you could say that, that go on thinking, go on reasoning, and you'll find when you freed yourself of this burden uh, of God belief that you have a, a happier and more fulfilled life. Um, so I, I don't think you should feel at all sad. I think you should rejoice in what you've achieved, and I think you should have persisted with her. <laughs> Thank you. I feel much better about myself now. Feel good about it. <laughs> okay, over here. Good evening, Richard, Julia. Um, so I'm from Kentucky, and so I'm really proud to be sharing a home with that monumental, you know, the monument to ignorance I'd known as the Ark Encounter. <laughs> Um, I've been there. I went, to, I went there. I was uh, there at a protest, and I got taken through the Ark, actually, by Kent Hovind. Or not Kent Hovind, but Eric Hovind, who is the son of Kent Hovind. So that was a really fun time for me. Um, so my question has to pertain to this, because now that we have a president who I haven't heard him say anything explicitly about evolution or science, but the Vice President Pence certainly has demonstrated a misunderstanding of evolution and science entirely. Um, and we seem in this country to be moving towards anti-intellectualism. And so my question is, what can someone like myself, who doesn't really have an audience, who's just kind of an average person, uh, do to fight the good fight and promote uh, scientific literacy and critical thought and these type of values? 
Yes. Um, well, obviously, vote. Um, encourage other people to vote. Encourage young people to vote. Discourage apathy. Uh, discourage anybody who says, oh, it doesn't, doesn't really make any difference. My vote doesn't count. Um, your vote does count. It's very important. Um, yes, become a teacher. Or, um, Join the openly secular campaign. Um, make an openly secular video. Encourage others to do the same. Uh, stand up tall and, and proclaim your beliefs without shame uh, and with pride. Um, and try to uh, join the movement, which is emulating the success of the gay movement, which has changed itself from being in the closet to out, uh, and, and, and is now proudly out, uh, we can do the same. Uh, and just join in. It is really hard. That's a hard nut, though, the anti-intellectualism. I mean, mm. I'm thinking about that a lot, especially with the recent polls and stuff I've read about this last election and how people are really reacting against what they see as this effete elite and cities drinking lattes and discussing, you know, like this anti-intellectualism. And I, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, like, I guess, I mean, like, I don't, I, I don't know if I'm an intellectual or not. I feel like I'm just an average person, but I feel like I am interested and curious about the world and I like to learn. And I guess to me, if I project myself as that in not a snooty way, but as in a just a curious, happy person way, that diffuses it. And also the people that I know who feel so anti-intellectual, it's like they, not, they don't even know what they're talking about. The group that they hate doesn't even really exist. I mean, like, so it's like this figment of their imagination that makes them feel bad somehow. And I don't know, that's a really hard nut to crack, but that is something we do need to think about. I mean, like, I don't know why that's, it's almost like the whole thing, and sometimes in the African American community where it's like, oh, you don't want to be getting good grades, or you don't want to be seen as one of the smart ones. Like, it's really damaging, and it's a really hard thing, you know, to make people not feel bad about themselves, but also elevate the idea of learning and curiosity and intelligence and success and demonstrating success and intelligence. I mean, you can't make everybody not feel bad. I mean, like, it's really, I think you're bringing up a really complicated thing that I don't know the answer to. It's really hard. Fair enough. <laughs> we have to make intellectualism cool. <laughs> I know. I think you've done that, Richard. Um, OK, I think we're going up here. I'm not keeping yeah. track. A uh, similar question to one that was asked earlier, but a little more detail, perhaps, is uh, do you find, are there any particular traits in evolution that you find particularly interesting, such as a uh, lobe fin fish or the recurrent laryngeal nerve within the neck of a giraffe? Well, you prompted me that, haven't you? Because <laughs> <laughs> you do like that one. Well, I do. Uh, um, <laughs> I mean, that, 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 that particular one is a good example of bad design. Um, and in a way, it's more vivid than the kakapo, which I mentioned earlier. Um, the, the recurrent laryngeal nerve goes from the brain. It's, it's a branch of one of the cranial nerves, the 10th cranial nerve. And it goes to the larynx, the voice box. But it doesn't go straight to the larynx. It goes down into the chest, does a U-turn around one of the big blood vessels, one of the big arteries in the chest, and go, then goes back up to the larynx, which is a, an unnecessary digression, um, which results from, the, from a historical accident. Um, in our fish ancestors, the most direct route from the brain to the, uh, the, what was the equivalent of the, of the larynx in those days um, was then south of, the, of that, what was the equivalent of that artery. So as evolution of the neck continued, and fish don't have a neck. So as, as the, for example, the mammal neck lengthened and lengthened and lengthened, um, the digression got longer and longer. And the, the marginal cost of each generational increase in the length of the digression was too small to bother about. 
it would have been a major embryological upheaval to have jumped it over the, the artery. So it didn't happen. All that happened was another millimeter got added to the digression. Well, in the case of a giraffe, that's a very substantial digression. <laughs> and I've actually seen this. I took part for a television program in a dissection of a giraffe. And we actually dissected the recurrent laryngeal nerve all the way down this vast long neck. And it went within inches of the larynx and, as it were, ignored it, and went straight on past, down into the chest, and back up again. And this may be why giraffes make such pathetic little moaning noises, rather like me tonight. <laughs> right. So that, that's a nice example of bad design, which would never pass muster uh, f uh, from an engineer with a drawing board, but is exactly what you'd expect, given that, um, that history is, is, is what's causing it. Thank you. Uh, my question is for uh, Professor Dawkins, and it concerns the uh, correctness of the phrase uh, modern evolutionary synthesis. Although I'm not a, a scientist by training, I'm a lawyer, which I hope you don't hold against me. I do, rather. But no. um, I, I, <laughs> I've been a trial attorney in Indiana for many years, and I've used those skills to engage creationists and biblical literalists, and I've learned in the courtroom Yay! <laughs> it, it doesn't pay well, but it's very satisfying. <laughs> uh, when I engage in these discussions, I, I want to be as accurate as possible so that I'm not committing many of the mistakes they make when they misstate many things about science and the laws of thermodynamics and the like. And often they will refer to me as a Darwinist, which I attempt to change and, and say, and, and say instead the, the, the correct phrase is perhaps modern evolutionary synthesis. And I know that really came from Huxley in the 1940s. I've recently been reading, though, that there are some questions about that modern evolutionary synthesis. And I've, I've been reading a, an author named Prothero who's talking about an, a new concept called evolution development. Uh, and so my question is, when I engage in these debates, am I correct to continue to use the phrase modern evolutionary synthesis and talk about how genetics and paleontology and field work and lab work are brought together, or should I move to a, a, a another phrase? It's an excellent question. Oh, I love um, this question. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, Julian Huxley, as you say, coined the phrase modern synthesis. He wrote a book called The Modern Synthesis. And what he was synthesizing was the work of people like Simpson on paleontology, Meyer on taxonomy, Fisher, Haldane, and Wright on uh, population genetics. The modern synthesis is the synthesis of uh, Darwinian evolution. Darwin had no concept of a gene. Darwin vaguely knew about heredity. He vaguely knew that like begets like. But it was uh, the addition of Mendelian genetics, the genetics of Gregor Mendel, the 19th century Austrian monk, um, it, which, uh, which, is a, which is actually digital in, in the sort of pre-DNA um, pre for, form. Um, so the, that's the modern synthesis. It dates from the 1930s and 40s. Um, you are entirely right to use that phrase. Carry on using it. Um, uh, it sometimes goes with the, with the phrase neo-Darwinism. Ne Neo-Darwinism can be regarded as the same as the modern synthesis. Um, the the evo-devo that you're talking about is a vogue phrase, which is interesting and important. Um, it's the synthesis of evolutionary ideas with embryological ideas. And of course, it's, very, it's an important fact, it's an obvious fact, that the, the evolutionary, the, the, the structures that, that we see, the anatomical structures that we see in which it evolve, uh, have to be made by embryology. And so you can't leave embryology out of it. And uh, there, there is a, a, a rather flourishing um, discipline called evolution, well, e evo devo, it's, a, it's uh, ab abbreviated to. And, and that's important, but there's absolutely no reason for you to stop using the phrase uh, modern synthesis, carry on using it. <laughs> and, and if I may follow up on a, a real quick question, I, am I allowed then in these debates to say that I ask Professor Dawkins personally? <laughs> <laughs> yes! And, you did! With pleasure. And, and using the argument from authority, smash their arguments to uh, pieces. Only a lawyer would bother to ask permission. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to make sure there were no copyright infringements. <laughs> Thank you.
Oh, two more questions. Okay, up here, just two more, sorry. Uh, yes, this is uh, in reference to a previous question that was asked. Um, how do we make the distinction between religiously motivated violence and more political ambitions? Uh, for instance, while in America and many atheists maintain that religion was the cause of 9-11, the people responsible cite an imperial U.S. occupation of the Middle East, specifically Saudi Arabia. Yes. Um, I think, um, I mean, my, my, my own opinion, I, I agree with, with Sam Harris that, that uh, in, in, in his phrase, these people really believe what they say they believe. They say their motivation is religious. And why wouldn't we believe them? Why is this amazing effort put into trying to think up other motives that they might have um, for doing what they, what they do? So I'm, I'm with Sam on, on this. I think their motivation is religious. Um, I think it's possible that religion is being used as a kind of political label. I think um, the phrase identity politics is banded around, and I sort of get that. that that some of the resentment that um, Muslims feel uh, against the United States and Britain and other powers and is that they feel that their identity is kind of being threatened. So it, it's possible that, that, that their identity as Muslims is, is, is being threatened. But if you listen to the rhetoric of the ISIS leaders and if you, if you listen to, if you read what they say in their publications. They're obsessed with religion. They're obsessed with Allah. They're obsessed with paradise. Uh, they're obsessed with Muhammad. Um, uh, it, it's very hard to think that their, that their motivation is not religious. No, I, I think it's more political. I look at it as a more political thing. Like, I think those people who are talking about religion, those ISIS leaders, mean it. I think they mean what they say. But I think political forces have pushed them into that position and that they are fighting for their identity and yeah. trying to defend their I think, I think I think both could be true. Yeah. 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 Um, oh, before we have the last question, I just want to say, Richard, just, just listening to him talk, which I love so much, I've been listening to his last memoir called The Brief Candle in the Dark, right? And it's on audiobook. I got it on Audible, and I've been driving around listening to Richard talk, and it is so fantastic because he reads his own book, and it's really um, sort of an anecdotal book, you would say, right, about your time at Oxford and your time interacting with all these different scientists and ideas. And it is so delightful. And for someone like me who just wishes I could live another life where I went off to Oxford and became a scientist, which is not going to happen, but it almost kind of can feel like it happened. I mean, um, listening to Richard in this book, I really, I mean, I guess the booksellers won't like this, but I really recommend you get the audio version of it because... And, and for me, I always love really hearing the author's voice, but I mean, it's such a great performance of your book, and it's such a great story, and it's such a great feeling as we drive around Chicago together, you and me, Richard, of me feeling <laughs> like I'm really hearing all these wonderful and intimate and interesting anecdotes from your life and getting to sort of feel like I'm participating in it. And it's really, I just really want to recommend that. Well, thank you, Julie. I, I, I didn't quote it so much in those days. <laughs> OK, let's have our last question. Well, thank you very much for coming this evening. I really appreciate it. I'm sure everyone else does here, too. And I have to admit that I spent the length of my wait thinking of that sort of genie in the bottle, the, the question that would allow me to ask three questions <laughs> for free. But luckily, most people ask them, including that lawyer. It's so crazy we had the same idea, that same question. <laughs> Just kidding. But my question, <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is more casual in sense. Um, it's uh, asking for more of a, an elaboration on this merge of two foundations that have come together. And um, you mentioned earlier there, you know, there are people who are action. Um, motivated. There are people who, uh, you know, are, are fine to support. There are people who don't care and don't do anything. And there are also people who are able and willing, um, especially now with the events that have happened. Um, can you elaborate a little yes. bit more on that foundation and how we can get involved? I, in I, I think it is a very fruitful merger. Um, I, I'm delighted by, by it, and it, it's just about to happen. I mean, a few little legal red tape to be to be tied up. Um, so. Um, the, the, the two boards of trustees are merging into, into one. 
Uh, Robin Blumner is the CEO of both. Um, Richard Dawkins Foundation will become a division of CFI. Um, CFI uh, has, uh, has other divisions uh, which include a stress on not just uh, re religion and atheism, but also um, skepticism of the sort of investigating homeopathy and telepathy and cold reading and, and spiritualism and, and that kind of thing. Um, so, it, so between us, we cover a whole range of rational, critical thinking, evidence-based concerns. Um, you can, uh, I, I, I think you're volunteering to help. I, I was looking for hire, actually. Um, looking for? Just <laughs> wondering what, what kind of expansion may be going on in the future. Well, I think, I mean, b you and anybody else who wants to help, talk to Robin ab about it, because um, it, it's a cause that is well worth getting in involved in, and, I, and as you've suggested, uh, even more so in the light of last night's catastrophe. You know, I just want to say for me, it was, I think, around 2003 when I really, you know, accepted the fact that I didn't believe in God anymore, and it was a very tumultuous experience and very difficult. And I just went online and found the Los Angeles CFI offices. That's how I found it. I saw there was a meeting on the Sunday where somebody was going to go and speak. And it was really a transformative experience for me. Like, I was able to take, they offered this um, five Sunday skeptical classes where this doctor from Stanford came and talked about how to be skeptical about medical claims. That was, for me, a huge revelation. Like, I met people who were like-minded. I was able to get more politically involved. Like, it really became a home base. And for me, who was sort of, you know, raised Catholic and had a lot of things I liked about the church, um, the CFILA was really a home. Like, that was the first time I was like, oh, here's other people that think like me, and I also feel like I can be involved politically and in a bunch of other ways. So. Anyway, I loved it, and I'm really excited about the merger. I think this is really going to be a powerhouse. Thank you for being a light in the dark right now. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. <laughs>